So as a result of climate change in the western United States and here in the central and southern Sierras, we're generally seeing an increase in disturbances. Uh, so for example, we're measuring an increase in the, the numbers of fires, the number of large fires. We're seeing an increase in bark beetle outbreaks in several different systems. As a result of that, we're seeing an increase in the interaction between those two disturbances. So California experienced a drought um, of unprecedented severity um, from roughly 2012 to, to 2015, 2016. Um, and that drought triggered massive increase in the amount of tree mortality throughout the state, but especially in the southern Sierra Nevada and central Sierra Nevada as well. So we are here in an area of, of relatively heavy tree mortality, but this is by no means an anomaly. Um, we've lost somewhere on the order of 129 million trees since 2010 most of those in, in 2016, even last year after what was almost a record winter in many areas in the central and southern Sierra Nevada, we still lost an additional 20-something million trees on the landscape. Uh, so I'm Michael Kuntz. I'm a fourth-year PhD student here at University of California, Davis. Uh, and I am studying how forest structure affects the resilience of forests. So how the physical arrangement of trees in the forest affects how we might expect forests to persist in the long run given wildfire and bark beetle disturbance. So drought is a reduction in the amount of precipitation in any, any given year. Uh, but with, you know, and that's, that's kind of a, a, a typical component of California systems, right? We have drought pretty regularly. That's a, that's a sort of common occurrence. But what we see now with climate change is that uh, not only do we have reductions in the amount of precipitation, but we have hotter temperatures. And so the combination of that reduced precipitation and hotter temperatures leads to what, what we call a hotter droughts, which are, you know, add additional water stress to these trees. When the air gets hotter, it can basically hold more moisture. And so it's going to be effectively sucking moisture out of the leaves of plants. And so what the average tree does, and this would be definitely true of ponderosa pines, which are really affected by the drought, is to primarily try to control their water loss when they, their roots sense that water is getting low or availability is low in the soil or the demand in the air and their leaves is too high. Relative to that, they would shut their stomata, the pores that let air into the leaf. So it's a sort of magical process. They take light and they take our waste gases and turn it into sugar, <laughs> turn it into food. Um, but to do that, they have to get carbon dioxide into the leaf, and so they can't keep working unless they get more, so they have to open their pores. Whenever that happens, water is escaping from the leaf. So there's always this trade-off of when they want to eat, they have to lose water. They have to use water in order to get carbon and eat. So when drought hits, generally they tend to lose water faster first as the temperatures get higher, but at a certain point, the kind of the tension between the water and the leaf and the water that they're trying to pull out of the soil gets high, and sensing that, depending on the plant, some plants can take much more of that than others. You know, drought-adapted plants can handle a lot more, stronger pull from the leaf and much drier soils. But at some point, um, all plants will close their stomata at that point, they're essentially holding their breaths, or they're, you know, probably more by analogy to animals, they're starving at that point. And so if a drought lasts a really long time, they're not actually eating because they can't fix more carbon, they can't make more sugars. And they're, so they're relying on the starch that they've stored from previous, you know, when they've been photosynthesizing before. And so gradually their reserves get depleted. If it goes on long enough, the plant will become really vulnerable to disease or beetle attack, or might even just die essentially of starvation. A tree is basically this whole bundle of tubes that's connecting the roots that are exploring the soil and pulling things out of that, and the fungi that are helping them do that. And then it's a sort of a super highway of tubes up to the canopy where all of these little biochemical factories are making food from the light carbon dioxide and the, using water to do that. So there's a huge amount of tension, there can be a huge amount of tension during a drought between the leaf on one hand and the, the root in the soil. And so you've got this long, thin column of water under tension. Um, and some of the times that tension gets too big and the water will basically, the column breaks, a bubble forms in the tubes going up the tree and the xylem going up the tree. And when that happens, that particular tube doesn't work anymore for pulling water up. And so if that happens in enough of the tubes, you can actually put like a little microphones on the sides of trees under drought stress and you can hear these little snaps and pops as the bubbles are forming. Columns of water are snapping. It can, in some cases, just permanently make that xylem tube unusable and the tree has to make more. 
you know, to, to be able to continue to move water and, and then eat, um, and photosynthesize and get food. Plants are fairly dynamic and able to refill those columns or those bubbles when they form if water becomes available and the tension gets less. So as a drought gets longer and longer, there tends to be a kind of a buildup of hydraulic damage or, you know, the number of these, the percentage of these tubes that have bubbles in them and don't work gets higher. So the water content of the wood gets lower. Most of these ponderosa pine trees were colonized and killed by western pine beetle here in 2015, kind of on the back end of a very severe drought that we experienced here in California that ended in the winter of 2016-2017. To put the drought event into perspective here, uh, 2015 was the hottest and driest on record. 2014 wasn't very far behind that. It was the second driest and third warmest on record. In fact, now we have some data coming out from some colleagues that suggest that this drought event was the most extreme event in certain locations in at least a 1200 year chronology. Something that's often observed in tree response to drought is, a, is this lag in which conditions become harsh, but it can take a year or more before we start to see that response in, in the trees. And there's a few reasons why that might exist. There's physiological reasons uh, in, in the trees itself, in themselves. They certainly have some buffering capacity that allows them to um, survive and, and grow and, and remain healthy even under um, brief periods of limited resources like like low water conditions um, in addition that we know that this in many areas where trees grow that the soil and 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 even sub soil regolith water reserves are really huge and can take a while to become depleted so we might have been observing um, a slow depletion of uh, or a prolonged almost persistence of water in the in the regolith that eventually became depleted combined with exhausting the trees um, biological and physiological buffers that allow them to tolerate drought for some period and, and so once we once we kind of exhausted all those buffers is I think when we started to, to see mortality really spike so in the case of, of this drought not until two or three years after precipitation levels started to really decrease did we see that massive spike in mortality. It does really matter whether or not we get our precipitation in the form of snow or rain. So if we get precipitation in the form of snow, it'll usually sit in the mountains for longer and it will slowly melt off into the streams when the temperatures start rising in the spring. And then also the more water will soak into the ground and that will be available for trees later on in the year. When we get our precipitation in the form of rain, then what happens is water moves through the system much more quickly. So we see you know, much quicker runoff into the streams and rivers and it flows downstream sooner. So it stays in the system a lot less longer. We usually see peak flows in our rivers much earlier in the year. So we just have this big pulse of water come through, but then it leaves the system and it's not really available to plants and wildlife. So you can imagine trees as a lot of straws in the ground trying to get to a limited water resource right and so uh, you know with a with the drought we have less precipitation and so less available moisture for these trees to be to be sucking up for their for their biological processes uh, and so when these trees are, are water stressed, they have less of an ability to uh, sort of defend against these insect attacks. But the primary defense the trees have is to, to physically expel those beetles by pushing uh, sap out of their, um, the, out of those boreholes. So they, they like physically push the beetles out. Uh, and so when the water is limited, those uh, trees can't be using those limited water resources to be expelling beetles because they need it for their own uh, maintenance and upkeep and growth and that sort of thing. So. Um, they're more vulnerable to that bark beetle attack because they can't defend against it. Uh, forests today um, are generally uh, much denser than they, they were historically, particularly in the historically um, fire-prone, fire-adapted forests. And that's primarily due to fire suppression. Um, we've aggressively suppressed fires in, uh, in those forests for over a century. and that has allowed small trees to establish and, um, and grow, and as a result, forests have become much denser than they historically were. And so that 
you know, fire suppression or any factor that leads to increased density is likely contributing to these high levels of mortality that, that we're seeing under drought conditions. One of the main drivers of stand density was these frequent fires. So when the fires would come through frequently, they would kill off a lot of the smaller trees, leaving a few survivors here and there. And usually the sort of larger trees with the um, bigger boles or tree trunks, those would be the survivors. So we had stands that were much more open. There were a lot fewer trees than what we see today. They were more pine dominated. So pines are typically more fire tolerant. They're better able to survive a fire than some of the tree species that we see more commonly in what we call lower mixed conifer forests today. So trees like cedar and uh, fir. So we had more pines, they were larger, and there were fewer of them. And then also, since fires were coming through so frequently, we just had a lot fewer small trees. So where I'm standing today, I think is kind of exceptional for Sierra Nevada forest today because the structure is so open. So by structure, I mean the spacing within the trees. As you can see, you know, compared to a lot of forests that you may have seen, um, there's really wide spacing in between the trees. And this is due um, to the prescribed burning that we've done here. So prescribed burning is when we as managers actually come in and start a fire and control it. And so this area has been burned roughly like every 10 to 15 years. And so we think that this stand here looks like what we would have expected these stands to look like historically. So before there was fire suppression and before trees started getting more dense in forest stands over time. Uh, so sort of back to that straws analogy with more trees in a, in a particular local area, that's, that's essentially more straws trying to get that small amount of water. So, you know, if the, if the water is limiting and there's more trees trying to get that limited water resource, then, then those trees, you know, each of them on average has uh, less water to go around. Uh, the bark beetles communicate by pheromones so that they uh, can call in additional beetles to mass attack a tree and sort of overwhelm that tree's defenses. Uh, and so there's, there's some evidence that that pheromone communication is disrupted when there's gaps between trees. And so if there's lot, not very many gaps between trees, if those trees are really dense, uh, then those pheromones can just sort of sit around and they aren't dissipated by the wind. Uh, and so it makes the beetle communication easier and it makes it makes the beetles job of calling in additional beetles to mass attack trees that much easier. The project that we're working on is to take drones and fly them over these sites and map 40 hectares around each one of these sites. So ultimately there's 36 sites in total and so we're hoping to get 40 hectares, about 100 acres around each of these sites. And so from each of those uh, maps we get a individual measure of where each tree is and what its sort of condition is we're using a multi-spectral camera which means that we're able to look in the infrared spectrum also and uh, trees are really sensitive to that when they're healthy or not and so we can we can learn about the individual tree health and where each individual tree is by uh, mapping them with with this drone and so the the predictors sort of for for this model of what would make a tree more likely to be attacked is is you know primarily it's it's local density how many trees are nearby to it that might be making it additionally stressed or it might be interrupting or not interrupting that pheromone communication. Um, it still seems to be an open question of what scale of density really matters, right? So you can imagine with a single tree, you can look at, well, how many trees are within 10 meters of that tree or how many trees are within 20 meters of that tree. And it's unclear which of those scales is, is the most important for predicting the tree mortality or, you know, the likelihood of beetle attack for that focal tree. Uh, and so those are those are kind of the things that we're after. So the the trees that are that are the most stressed are the most vulnerable to getting killed by these by these beetles when they attack. Uh, and so we see a huge amount of mortality in the southern latitudes, uh, and you know I'd, I'd expect a, a little bit more mortality in the in the sort of lower elevations also, where where the trees might be hotter and uh, the conditions might be drier, such that they're more more stressed and more susceptible to that bark beetle attack. We were interested in understanding what factors explain the spatial variation in in those mortality patterns, because even though there was a massive increase in mortality, the spatial configuration of, of where the mortality occurred, um, there was still a lot of variation in that. Um, and so we were interested in, in looking at what explains that. With the, the ultimate objective being um, gaining some insight into 
how, how, what we might expect in the future with more droughts in the future um, or just climate change generally. So we use data collected by the U.S. Forest Service Aerial Detection Monitoring Program, which involves flying a small aircraft over the majority of the forested area of the state every year. They do these surveys, uh, repeat surveys every year. And when they fly over the forest, they record the location and number of dead trees that they observe in, um, across, across space. And so we, we used the data that they collect, but we converted it into a grid. So we had a standardized unit that we could analyze. So we, we converted it into a grid that's about um, four kilometers on each side of, of, of a given grid cell. And we, we computed the amount of mortality that was observed in each grid cell. Um, then we took um, environment, uh, environmental data um, of the same spatial resolution, um, particularly um, forest density data and um, climate data, um, specifically the uh, data representing the, the long-term average aridity of, of, e of each location. And we looked at how those variables, so the density and aridity, how they explain the, um, the spatial variation in the mortality patterns. Forests that are denser, so where, where there's you know, more trees or larger trees per unit area had higher mortality rates. And also areas that are um, drier, more arid um, climatic regions had higher mortality rates. Not only did, uh, did we see increased mortality in denser stands and drier stands, but we found that the influence of density was stronger in drier areas. So there was, an added, there was a more than additive effect. There was an interactive, um, um, almost synergistic effect of those two variables at the same time. By far the, the species most strongly affected by, by drought um, was ponderosa pine. Most of the mortality uh, appears to be driven by the western pine beetle. It's possible that it's because of its um, susceptibility to that beetle that it was the species that was um, most impacted. 2298, live. 2290, dead standing. We've installed 180 plots um, throughout the central and southern Sierra Nevada to kind of monitor and look at the impact of the bark beetle outbreak and look at change over time, causal agents of the tree death, um, regeneration, recruitment, invasive weeds, um, pollinator abundance. Here I just wanted to point this out, we're also looking at fuels. Obviously we expect an increase in fuels as the trees fall down. Um, none of these trees that you see here on the ground were here last year, so it's kind of a good illustration that how quickly things are changing. And how many of the ponderosas are uh, dead on this plot? All of them. <laughs> so all of them are dead, and I had two that were attacked in 2014, and the rest um, were 2015. So yeah, we are looking at how long it takes the trees to fall. Everybody wants to know that in terms of management and fire risk. Um, and we have seen, we've just started our third field season and we're seeing trees fall much quicker than we expected. We expect them to fall quicker here than we would in a drier, colder system like mountain pine beetle killed lodgepole in the Rockies. But um, so far, I would say that they're falling even faster than we expected. So here, many of the trees that have been killed have actually been killed by an interaction between drought and native bark beetles. Bark beetles in general, this very large and fascinating, diverse group of organisms, there's actually greater than 6,000 species worldwide, greater than 550 in North America alone. We tend to focus on a much smaller subset of that much larger group, and those are species that are capable of causing large amounts of tree mortality. And here in the central Sierra Nevada, maybe seven or eight species might actually meet that definition. Most of these trees here have been colonized and killed by a species known as western pine beetle. Generally, we don't see large outbreaks of these native bark beetles in any of our systems. 
unless two conditions are met. We must have favorable climatic and favorable vegetative conditions coinciding in time and space. So here, what we had on the landscape was an abundance of suitable hosts, large diameter ponderosa pine, at a time when the hosts themselves were stressed by this very significant drought event. In many cases, what we can do is actually remove the bark off the tree and look at the gallery patterns that have been left, either on the bowl of the tree itself or or on the inner bark, as we refer to it as the phloem. And so here you can see these S-shaped galleries, which are very characteristic of colonization by the species Western pine beetle. So a bark beetle in general spends the vast majority of its lifetime within a tree. Its job is to get from one tree to another tree as quickly as possible. During the initial phases of colonization, beetles will actually begin to colonize most of these trees at about three meters in height initially done so by the females, and then the females will start to release what we call an aggregation pheromone component. And this is something that they naturally produce that attracts other beetles to the tree to facilitate, facilitate colonization of this individual tree. Once this tree begins to fill up, the beetles actually produce a different type of pheromone that we call an anti-aggregation pheromone. In this context, it's known as verbenone, that essentially says, hey, this tree's full, please disperse and colonize the next available tree. And in doing so, you can see how they regulate their attack densities, not only on an individual tree basis, but on up to a landscape basis. So what the beetle does is actually bores into the tree, typically through one of these bark crevices. And healthy trees will generally respond with the production of these pitch tubes. Here you see very few because this tree was very stressed at the time of colonization and therefore wasn't very capable of defending itself. Once the beetle ent enters the tree, mating occurs, egg laying occurs, and essentially both the adults as well as the developing larvae will girdle the tree and disrupt water and nutrient transport within the tree, which essentially results in mortality of the tree in a relatively short period of time. So for most bark beetles, they, they kind of finish out their entire life cycle within the phloem and then simply emerge back through the bark in search of a new tree to begin a new generation of beetles. With western pine beetle, they actually enter the tree, mate, lay eggs, run through some of the earliest instars, as we refer to them, just the different developmental stages of the larvae. But then eventually the latter stages begin to move into the outer bark, which is distinct to the, to the western pine beetle. So in many cases, we can actually look at a tree and tell you that it's been colonized and killed by western pine beetle just because of the pattern of woodpecker activity on that tree. And when western pine beetle is, is colon, has colonized a tree, woodpeckers typically will get in that tree and actually flake the bark off in search of the larvae and pupae that are occurring in the outer bark. They actually inject a whole bunch of other flora and fauna into the tree upon colonization by the beetle. And one of the best recognized is the presence of blue stained fungi. These are fungi that the beetles actually carry on their integument and in specialized structures and again inject into the tree upon colonization by the beetle. Now we generally debate as to the contribution of blue stained fungi in terms of tree mortality, but we do know clearly that the fungi confers a competitive advantage to the developing larvae in which they tend to feed on the blue stain as well as the phloem. We also see quite a bit of variability in their life history and so depending on the bark beetle species, the tree species, different abiotic conditions, some other factors, may take a bark beetle several years to complete a, a single life cycle or they may be able to complete several generations as we refer to them in a single year. Here in the case of western pine beetle, generally western pine beetle completes three generations a year in this area of California. If you look carefully at these pitch tubes, you can actually see the presence of the phloem, this kind of pink material that has been incorporated into the pitch tube. And what's occurring there, that's an indication that the adult beetle has actually reached the phloem and is pushing phloem particles or sawdust out into the pitch tube. And so generally on some trees we can come and take a look at the pitch tubes and that'll give us an indication as to how successful these attacks were. These attacks are all successful. We actually know that because the tree itself has is, is died several years ago. Um, but in some cases you might find pitch tubes that are very clear, yellow, 
with little or no sawdust incorporated into them. And that's generally indicative of the tree being successful in kind of pushing out and encapsulating the beetle itself. Again, this would be considered one of the primary defenses of a tree to colonization by bark beetle. So dendr dendroctinus literally means tree killer. Um, and they tend to be more aggressive. There's this other genus called Ips, which are engraver beetles, which under normal circumstances, preferentially colonize dead and dying trees or slash or something like that. So this is another dendroctinus. This is not western pine beetle, but this is mountain pine beetle. And the reason, again, you can, I can tell you that is the distribution and orientation of the galleries. Furthermore, dendroctinus, their galleries are filled in frass, so you can still see all the frass in there. Where Ips beetles actually have elytra that are kind of scooped out on the back end that they use to push the frass back out of that entrance hole, so their galleries would be clean of any frass. I mean, here's kind of one with the characteristic J at the end, little hook. And here's where an egg was laid and the egg hatched. In the early instar larvae, you can see how small that gallery pattern that the really small larvae leave behind. It gets larger and larger and larger and larger until it pupated somewhere in there and then bored out and probably came out of that exit hole right there. Uh, here at the end of this gallery, you can see actually that there's a deceased adult. Again, that's mountain pine beetle and Drachinus ponderosi, which is quite active in our sugar pine component here. But again, most of this tree mortality is associated with western pine beetle and Drachinus brevicomis. In response to the wounding of the tree by western pine beetle, red turpentine beetle will perceive those tree volatiles and come in and colonize the base of the tree. This is physically the largest bark beetle in North America, so probably something about somewhere about that in length. And it's also the most widely distributed. It, goes, it occurs on the west coast all the way back to the east coast. Most all red turpentine beetle attacks occur from about uh, two meters down. Typically, most of them are confined to the, bite, the base of the tree. But there's some great examples of, of the frass and the, all these being pink are again indicative that this beetle was able to reach the flow. This is actually what we consider to be a more primitive bark beetle. And so it doesn't have very distinct galleries like S-shaped for western pine beetle or J-shaped for mountain pine beetle. This actually feeds in a patch. So if we were to remove this bark, we would just see a patch of phloem missing where they fed gregariously. Generally, you know, RTB is not regarded to be a, a primary tree killer. Um, we do see it kill trees outright. Some unique examples following a lot of root damage to trees, following some high severity fires, but not generally a primary tree killer. Yeah, so one of the major concerns when, when looking at ecological goods and services is how this tree mortality event and others in the West might affect fire risk in some It's been a very active area of research in the last decade or so. A lot of work originally done in the lodgepole pine forest in the Rocky Mountains and the spruce forest in the Rocky Mountains, and we're just beginning some of that work here. One of the unique concerns in our frequent fire forests is that we've had a very large tree mortality event killing large numbers of large diameter trees in a very short period of time. And we're now observing those trees falling and becoming part of the surface fuel profile. I'm Mark Smith. I work for the United States Forest Service. I'm a battalion chief. I've been with the Forest Service for 32 years. Uh, worked here on the Sierra for the last 25. In those mortality stands, you, what you're seeing with those things, you see the loss of canopy, so you have uh, increased sun exposure, so a quicker drying. Uh, they're more exposed to the wind because they don't have the wind resistance based uh, on the loss of canopy. And then these trees have been in a dead state for, you know, five years now. They're, so they're, they're starting to decompose. The tops are falling out. We're seeing, a, you know, most of them have lost all their limb wood, uh, all their needles. So you have a, a real heavy ground component. And that's going to be your carrier. So whether the tree burns or stands there, it's not so much the tree. It's already dead. But the resistance is a control on just how much material is on the ground. Is On a hot day, it's just going to, the fire is going to spread. Going into a stand of all dead trees here, it's, if you're gonna go in there for a fire, most likely you're gonna get hit by a falling, falling tree. So 
typical direct attack is not always going to be your first option because of the hazard to the firefighter. So backing off the roads, backing off the ridges, moving into greener timber, moving into brush fields, uh, getting on ridges, areas outside the tree. So um, not necessarily saying that the fire is necessarily your growth, but the fire is going to be bigger because you're going to box in a, a large area of dead trees just out of, for your own safety. In a case of a lightning strike where it's taken some moisture, you usually have a window of time where you can go in and suppress directly and keep it very small. But once the fire grows into and starts burning the trees, and it does bring a, an element of safety in there that has to be monitored um, time of day. If you're in some of these stands at night, you know, what a tree looks green between green and red is really obvious in the day, but in nighttime, looking up with a headlamp, looking up at it's not as clear cut as you would think it would be there. So you can't at night, can't always see the hazard. So when that's a great time to fight fire when you have things are cooler and everything else, but it also brings an increased risk because of the mortality of the dead trees in there. So uh, one of the questions we commonly get is what's the future forest going to be? And that's something we're studying now. We really don't have any definitive answers. But if you look on the landscape here at this location, at, at the lower elevations in the central and southern Sierras, most of the ponderosa pine, in fact, on this site, all the ponderosa pines have been killed. So at this stage, what we're left with in general is small diameter incense cedar, as well as a few black oak, as well as a few Kenyan live oak. The question of whether ponderosa pine is, is shifting its range upward as a consequence of either this, this, this past drought or, or climate change in general is, is a, a very much an open question still. Um, on the one hand, yes, so we do see the highest levels of mortality at the lower elevations, those hotter, drier sites, which would suggest that those lower range limits are shifting upwards, that range is contracting. Um, but for that to be um, a factor in the long term, we would, um, that would have to come along with limited natural recovery of the, of the species in those same areas. But um, that's, the jury's still out on that as to whether trees will um, naturally recover in, the, in those areas that were hardest hit by um, drought mortality. And then the other question is whether the species will be able to establish upslope in sites where, that are becoming climatically suitable but where the species was not previously found. And um, we actually have some other research looking at establishment of trees following disturbance. And, we see some sensitivity of trees to climate and weather variation um, that could allow for species to establish in sites that were, where they historically were not found. Um, but we also see that that, that capacity to, to establish in new sites is, is strongly restricted by seed availability. It's, it's conifers, uh, the major conifers in this system, especially ponderosa pine, um, they have large seeds that they are dispersed by animals uh, um, in addition to wind and gravity, but um, the proportion of seeds that can reach long distances is relatively small. So um, that, that dispersal limitation is a major factor influencing the potential for tree, tree ranges to shift in response to climate change the beetles have preferentially attacked the larger trees, and so those would have been the trees that would have produced a lot of the seed for the new young trees. And we have some of the younger, smaller trees left and the regenerating you know, trees that came up from seed. But what we're afraid of is if a big fire comes through, we might lose all of those young trees, they're not the type of trees that are probably going to be able to survive a big fire. So if we you know, have lost the bigger trees to the beetle mortality and then the smaller trees to a fire, then we're not sure where the seed source is going to come for the next generation of pines to reestablish some of these areas. So it might take a long time to repopulate some of these places with pines, if ever. Because denser stands appear to be more susceptible to drought, it kind of, it follows logically that any management that can help reduce the density of those stands might uh, reduce the risk of drought mortality. So thinning, so mechanically removing um, trees that have um, filled in as a result of fire suppression, or um, uh, bringing in prescribed fire, which can do the same thing, or even um, allowing 
natural wildfires to burn as long as they they burn at a you know moderate or low severity um, rather than a, a high severity that would just kill all the trees. One of the concerns we have too is, you know, I mean the major disturbance normally in these systems would have been very frequent fire regimes, low intensity, low severity, but very frequent fires. And that's, you know, that causes a lot of disturbance that allows for the seed bed to support ponderosa pine. Here, if we don't get a fire, um, you know, you have these very large accumulations of, of litter and duff that is of disadvantage to, to ponderosa pine regeneration in a lot of cases. It needs some scarification of the soil. One benefit of restoring stands to their more historic conditions, like in this case, a more open condition, is that we can um, help develop more resilient forests that are better able to withstand future droughts. So we expect that we can have, you know, longer, hotter droughts. And by creating a op more open st stand structure, we think that these forests will be more resilient to them. We also think that they can better withstand future fires. So over time, we've observed that, observed that we've had larger fires and fires that burn hotter. And by um, allowing fire to move frequently through an area and to keep consuming all the fuel that builds up over time, um, we're more likely to be able to maintain trees on the landscape because trees like this will be able to withstand a low severity fire, whereas they won't be able to survive a high severity fire. So forest heterogeneity is uh, how variable a forest is in a particular local sort of spot. So it sort of relates to that spatial structure of forests and uh, where the trees are and how big those trees are and what species those trees are. Uh, so if you can imagine a, a forest with all of the trees of the same size and the same height that are planted evenly, evenly spaced throughout the forest, we would call that a homogeneous forest because it's very even. Uh, but typically in these kind of fire adapted systems, we end up with uh, forests with, with a lot of this heterogeneity, a lot of this variability where there's trees in groups and trees of different heights and trees that are spaced uh, at different distances from each other. And so uh, that, you know, sort of an emerging paradigm in forest ecology is that that heterogeneity, that variability in forest structure uh, allows the forest to absorb change from these fire disturbances and from bark beetle sort of uh, insect attacks and uh, remain as forests instead of perhaps converting to like a shrub kind of system. There's a lot of work going into uh, looking at sort of what kind of heterogeneity we can create in a, in a sort of management context. Uh, and you know, that, that can uh, often happens as a result of, you know, taking a chain, like literally taking a chainsaw to the forest and cutting down particular trees and, and sort of leaving that patchwork of mortality that we might expect if a, if a natural fire were to burn through, uh, or implementing prescribed fire on the ground where we intentionally set fires uh, and, and you know, sort of let the fire do the work of, of creating uh, that patchwork of mortality also. So we can influence heterogeneity in a management context. But one of the things about forests that I think is just is, is fascinating, and particularly disturbance in forests is so great to study, is because ordinarily forests sort of move and develop and change slowly. And they almost seem like permanent things, like you know, a cathedral or something that's going to be there forever. But in fact, they're changing all the time. It's just subtle. But the times when you really can see it happening in real time and, and understand how it's going to react and maybe see the future of the forest is after it's been hit with something unusual, like a drought or a fire. And then you can see those sort of dynamics of speeding up and um, get a better window into what's controlling the, why the forest looks the way it does and how it will look in the future.